week, across the nation, the radio industry celebrates its 25th anniversary of broadcasting. This week in San Francisco, station KQW observes its 33rd anniversary of regularly scheduled broadcasting and its 36th birthday. For this radio station was the first in the world to broadcast regular programs. It's worth hearing the story of KQW, because it begins as the story of one man, his dream, his ambition, and the kind of courage it took to lead all the pioneers in starting the first broadcasting station in the world. This, then, the story of KQW in the days of its early development, is the unique story of one man, Charles D. Harold. All facts presented in this program, which throws several new lights on the already interesting history of broadcasting, are based on carefully authenticated documents, interviews, and newspaper files. As a preface to our story, we quote from the book entitled California, published by Hastings House, 1943 edition. That publication's first sentence in the section on radio reads as follows. The first California radio station to broadcast a human voice, KQW of San Jose, initiated in 1912, regular broadcast of speech and music. The story of KQW, as we begin by turning time back before the beginning of this century. 1897. From his platform in Stanford University, a professor lectures to the class in senior physics. There are indications that sound may be transmitted without the use of wires, but learned men know its only value would be that of a toy. On the other hand, experiments at conveying music for many miles distant by telephone have been astonishingly successful. Think of it, gentlemen. We may yet live to see, or should I say hear, <laughs> music carried to all the homes in the land by undreamed of telephone sets. <clears throat> well, are there any questions? Uh, Professor. Yes, Mr. Uh, Harold. You have a question, Mr. Harold. Well, uh, if a sound could be transmitted without wires, Professor, like code, I mean, that is... What else but code do you think could be transmitted without wires, Mr. Harold? <laughs> well, that's what I'm getting at. Then why can't the human voice be transmitted, too? Oh, it's fantastic. The question of a dreamer, I'm sorry to say. My young man, evidently you've been asleep during my recent <laughs> lectures. You've overshot the scientific intent of the wireless, my boy, as well as its basic principle... After some of its present difficulties are solved, the gadget may be put to a useful purpose. In fact, I dare differ with my colleagues in predicting that the wireless may come to be useful as a supplement to the cable. Uh, if you please, class, I shouldn't want to be repeated on that rash statement. So no notes, please. Only as a supplement to the cable, Professor? Well, well, Mr. Harold again... Uh, what would you like to suggest this time, that the very noisy and inadequate wireless might be made to transmit music as well as the human voice? <laughs> you know, I've been wondering about that. <laughs> the transmission of code. No dream today, nor was it at the beginning of this century. For the early experiments with the wireless were with code, and so were its first practical uses. But to transmit any sound other than code was beyond the consideration of scientists. Today, as a result of broadcasting, more music has already been played in actual amount of time than the world had ever heard before. The greatest of masterpieces enter the humblest of homes, a public service of radio that's as free as the air. But the scientists at the turn of the century were right as far as they went. At that early date, it was impossible to produce the sustained carrier wave radio requires for the transmission of music and voice. Many scientists worked on the problem, separately in their scattered laboratories, together in the common purpose. And then, in 1907, one of these men accomplished the impossible. Uh, Doc, here's something in that New York paper. I... Can't you wait? I'm having trouble setting this crystal. But here's an item about the wireless. I thought you'd be interested. Oh, let's see. Uh-huh. Uh, where? Well, it's kind of hard to find. There's no headline. Way down there on the fourth page, see? Oh, yes, about Dr. Lee DeForest mm -hmm. and his transmission of... George, why didn't you tell me sooner? I just happened to run across it, and it's a wonder, only two lines. Two lines? And it's history. It's transmitted music. 
I knew it could be done. Now, take it easy, Doc. It's here. It's really been done. Now we're going to see the beginning of something so big, I'm going to be a part of it. Sure, Doc. But don't get hot under the celluloid. This, what's his name, this Lee DeForest beat you to it. I see you haven't gotten the idea. In science, a thing like this, we aren't running a race. We're all together, piling more facts on more facts until, who knows, maybe the air will be filled with music. There you go, dreaming again. Huh. This is quite an old paper. It's been several months since Madame Geraldine Farrar sang over that transmitter. wonder if her voice was sustained in the ether waves. I'll have to get in touch with Dr. Lee DeForest. Do you know, I have an idea. I could get a lot of help from a man like that. 1907, and the first demonstration of the transmission of the human voice and music was accomplished without wires. For that first broadcast was a song. 1945, 38 years later, at the beginning of this week, that same Dr. Lee DeForest appeared on the Columbia Network, introduced with pride as the father of broadcasting. His voice brought to all the nation by means of the miracle he first demonstrated, the transmission of the human voice without wires. But that first experiment of broadcasting the human voice was soon forgotten by all but a few. And among the few was Charles D. Harold, who kept on remembering when he set up a new enterprise in San Jose in 1908. The Herald Radio and Engineering College. That's a fancy shingle, Doc. Think I'm hanging it high enough, George? Well, it looks just right where it is. Well, here it goes, for better or worse. <laughs> looks like you'll make a lot of mazuma out of this school, Doc. I'll need to. That's what I say. And spend it while you can. Some of my ideas are going to cost a lot of money. Now, Doc, you ain't going to start that again. Look. From where I hear, you'll get a couple of hundred students signed up. Why, you can retire, lead a life of ease at Coney or some other classy place. No, George. We all have our desires, and money isn't mine. I don't suppose I'll ever be rich, the way you think of it, or most people. What other way is there? I guess it's a case of what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Take that experiment of Dr. Lee DeForest now. It was a great thing, but there's more to it. I don't suppose I'll ever be satisfied until I've proved to myself whether I can make good on some of the hunches about that. There go your profits. Well, this isn't getting the school started. I can hardly wait for the first class. Something tells me I'll begin with an experimental lab session. Ah, free help. Well, I'll get a lot of technical assistance that way. <laughs> and if I'm able to do what I think I can, I'm going to need them. 198. With a demonstration of voice broadcasting already successful the year before, and the ether waves still containing only the occasional transmission of code. The beginning of 1909. Still no voices in the air, no music, only code. Then something happened in an inconspicuous school in San Jose, the Herald Radio and Engineering College. Well, I don't know what to do. He's getting all this wire. All right, all right, let's go to work. Hey, look, here, Doc. You tell us, boys, huh? What are we going to do with all this wire? One at a time, please. Oh, now, you've all seen the theory behind this demonstrated on the blackboard. Well, how do we know it's going to work? That's right. Why should we go to all this trouble when maybe the gadget won't work? That's what I well, say. it's like I this. Like in science, and radio is certainly a vital part of the science of physics. Yeah. You know that. Well, as I was saying, scientists don't expect their experiments to work. They don't. Ah, uh, pulling our oh, legs, huh, Doc? No, no, I'm very <laughs> serious. Serious. The true scientist expects every experiment to fail, except the last one. Hey, that's pretty good. Yeah. Let's go. Wait till I tell Mabel. Yeah, no, Doc. Mabel. Hey, Doc, there's an awful lot of work to this. If you don't expect it to well, work... Well, just between all of us and the gatepost, I believe I've already had the last experiment. You mean you've already tried out this aerial? On a small scale, and I'm convinced it's practical. Well, if you say so, Doc, what are we waiting for? Yeah. All right. All right. What... Now for the manual labor. Oh, now, first, we have to run up know. these wires to the top of those buildings. All this wire? Hey, I'll bet there's a mile of wire here. More than that. According to my calculations, this carpet aerial requires 11,500 feet of wire. Now we have to get all of that oh, seven stories up in the air? Uh-huh. 
Oh, it has to be suspended God. between these oh, two buildings. Hey, Pat, what seems to be your trouble? Well, I got so dizzy looking at the tall buildings, I uh, I got tangled up. Hey, <laughs> Pat, the car. <laughs> God, God, God. God. When we oh, get that too. much wire up, they ought to be able to hear us clear over to Palo Alto. Oh, yeah. Yeah. other than that, I oh. certainly hope. San Francisco, at the very least. Not oh, 50 no. whole right. miles. Hey, what are you oh, giving us, no. Don? Isn't oh, San Francisco, no. if we're successful at all, much farther. All right, men, let's hoist it up. Let's go get the wire. I don't know what to do. I'll try to get it up there. Oh, 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 oh. Spring of 1909. And although there's been music in the air for one brief moment two years before, there's still no music continuing on the ether. It's still code. Until something different is transmitted from the Garden City Bank building in San Jose and carried across space to San Francisco. Hey, that voice is coming all the way from San Jose. Are you sure you got the call right? Sure. Here's the call. I copied it down. Let me see. This is a wireless telephone from the Garden City Bank building in San Jose, California. Well, Doc Harrell's done it. Man, I wish we could answer that call. Oh, fine chance we'd have of getting through without his fancy rig for an aerial. Well, why should we keep on riding a horse when it looks like the horseless carriage is here to stay? I'm going to write to Doc and ask him how he does it. Spring of 1909, and Charles Harrell's experimental maze of suspended wires for running the powerful vertical antenna of a generation beyond has proved its worth. There had been other instances of transmission over longer distances, but the event was a milestone in the development of Charles Harrell's pioneer broadcasting station. For now, he had transmitted voice more than 50 miles. On to November 18, 1913, when a code message was being received. said code. Funny, I can't get any code on that wavelength. Well, switch to something else. I was getting something all the way from San Jose a minute ago, too. That's some distance. I think we can hear him clear up here in Bremerton. Hey, that's a thousand miles. Better not switch off. I won't. Maybe this music will get off. Did you say music? Oh, my gosh. I said music. It's music. Let me have those earphones. Oh, no, you don't. Here, I'll tilt this one so we can both listen. Did you hear it? Yeah, just before it stopped. This is sensational. I hope the code confirms it. This is the wireless telephone on the Garden City Bank building in San Jose, California. No code. Well, who wants code? It was a voice. That voice traveled a thousand miles. Man, alive. I hope he brings us some more music and keeps on talking. <laughs> I'd like to hear that fella keep up a regular line of chatter. Sure would help to pass the time. Well, it's getting so we can't depend on these airwaves at all. Expect code and you get a voice, even music. Something really new had been added to radio. Entertainment. On the air for more than just a few brief moments. And they heard Charles Harold, his voice and his gramophone records over long distances across the sea, as far north as Bremerton, Washington. You there, glued to the earphones. Would you mind repeating what you just said? Well, like I was saying, I hope that fella keeps up a regular line of chatter. Sure would help to pass the time. Well, now, I think I'll tell you about the weather. Passing the time of day by means of the wireless... Who'd ever thought of such an outlandish idea? Outlandish then, but today, in 1945, the world of radio means the world of entertainment. The greatest show on earth comes to you by radio. In his studio laboratory, Charles Harold worked to solve the difficulties that stood in the way of presenting radio entertainment. All right, Ray. I think I've got this other microphone ready to go. They burn out on us fast enough. Oh, we'll get that licked. Well, let's get the air busy again. Mm -hmm. Should be about ready to go, Doc. You didn't give it time to cool off much. I can't help it, Ray. There's something about this idea of broadcasting regular programs. Well, I just can't get rid of the idea that there's something to it, that's all. That was in 1912. The year Charles Harold first began regular broadcasts from his station. The same broadcasting station that is now known as KQW. Station KQW, on the air since 1909. And in 1912, 
KQW became the first station in all the world to present regular programs. That means KQW has been on the air since 1909, for 36 years. Yet this occasion we're observing tonight is the official 25th anniversary of radio. That means this radio station began broadcasting 11 years, 11 full years before commercial radio was born. Began regular programs eight years before the official birth of radio. And uh, this station has been on the air continuously ever since 1909? No, for in the early days, they were intensive technical difficulties. It's the microphones, Doc. They keep burning up. We'll have to find a better method. All right, let's switch her back on. On the air, off again. Back on, back off the air again, and on again. Broadcasting engineers of the present era, accustomed to the finest equipment modern science has devised, would laugh if they could have seen the crude, homemade equipment that kept the forerunner of KQW on the air. They'd laugh if they could have seen Charles Harrell sit down at his conglomerate equipment. But if they could have seen him when he started to play at the business of presenting programs, they'd marvel. For crude as were his implements, Charles Harrell knew the basic principles of broadcasting. And what he didn't know, he knew that he didn't know and worked tirelessly to solve. And while he worked, he kept on broadcasting. And people began talking. All of them wires strung over them buildings. My, my. All that time he's a-wasting. Well, I suppose his students get some good out of doing something, even if what they're doing ain't good for nothing. And there were others who had a few words to say. Doesn't seem so bad being bedridden now. I used to think that there wasn't any brightness left in the world. But now there's Doc Harold bringing me music. Why, it's the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me. Yes, Charles Harold continued to work on equipment while he kept on bringing the world its first radio programs. Then, in 1912, this radio station entered a new era and set a bold new pattern for the tremendous broadcasting industry that was to follow eight years later. Have you got the microphones? Yes, I've got them, and they're connected. Funny, they don't look the same, Doc, hooked up like that. I know, Ray. But they're just as sturdy as in the lab. Think four of them will be enough. Well, we'll see. It's a great theory, Doc. Absolutely great. Water-cooled microphones. We'll see if they work. And if they don't, well, we'll still have that last experiment to look forward to. You know, the one that works. That'll be this one. Looks like the solution. As long as we've been burning out the old ones so fast... Yeah, if we just didn't have to tie the microphones right into the antenna circuit. Well, these water-cooled mics will do the trick. Throw on the switch. Mm -hmm. If they work, we'll be able to maintain continuous broadcasting. Why, if these new microphones just hold up, we can keep the programs going from six to eight hours without interruption. Here she goes. Now we'll see. It worked. The ingenious device of resisting heat in microphones with water succeeded. From 1912 on, except during the years of the First World War, when Charles Harold was engaged in radio war work, this radio station, even in those pioneer days, was on the air regularly. In 1912, too, this radio station established another first. Hello, San Francisco. Come in, San Francisco. Hello, Doc Harold. This is the station in the Fairmont Hotel, San Francisco. You've done it. Excellent. The contact is established. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of Radio Land, you are about to hear the first two-way broadcast. And we're bringing you this entertainment from San Francisco and San Jose. Uh, will you accept the honor of playing the first musical selection, Fairmont Hotel? Doctor, the pleasure's mine. For your first election, you will hear in the shade of the old apple tree. Another record, the first two-way voice communication blended into a radio program. A record of small importance today but a milestone in radio history. And the water-cooled microphones invented by Charles Harold 
succeeded in keeping the airlines hot from six to eight broadcasting hours a day on through 1913, 1914, and 15. Curious that it was a scientist who first insisted that the wireless should be used for entertainment. For the rest of the scientists, as well as the businessmen, were saying, This wireless telephone, it isn't really so effective for communication. Why, there's nothing private about it. Anybody can tune in the messages. Too bad it will never be anything but a toy. But there was one other exception. Listen to these words from a letter highly valued in the history of broadcasting. I have in mind a plan of development which would make radio a household utility in the same sense as the piano or phonograph. The idea is to bring music into the home by wireless. David Sarnoff, later to become the head of RCA, wrote those words. He was considered ahead of his time. Yet he wrote that letter in 1916. Seven years after this radio station began presenting programs, four years after this radio station began regular broadcast service. Yes, there were those who even in the very early days thought the wireless was here to stay. And in 1915, Charles Harold was given his chance to prove it. Oh, well, this is a surprise. Inspector Stone. No, don't be formal, Doc, please. After all, a call from the United States Radio Inspector. Well, this is hardly official. The fact is, uh, I'm here because of the Panama Pacific International Exposition. Oh, yes, I hear they're all excited in San Francisco. How are the exhibits coming? Well, now that, Doc, is what I was sent to see you about. An invitation, an honor, a command performance. A request to broadcast programs for the Panama Pacific International Exposition. The KQW of Knee Pants was going on review. Sounds like somebody had built a better mousetrap. And the world had asked for a demonstration. The Panama Pacific Exposition of 1915. All the world milling through San Francisco. And most of the crowd stopping before the booth that was demonstrating the wireless. I'm going back to the Midway. No way. What's that? Oh, it's an exhibit of the wireless. Well, from everything I've heard, it's here to stay. And Fatima is... Come on, let's go. Come on! Come on! I've always wanted to see how this gadget works. Well, there's a gramophone. No, it's the wireless. Don't be foolish. There's the gramophone horn. Where's the disc? Tell me that. It's all done with mirrors. You know how these things are. Listen. We're playing for the exposition, folks. So here's the latest music on a cylinder. When you wore a tulip, a big yellow tulip, and I wore a big red rose. It talks, didn't I tell you? It's Doc Harold's wireless program. Kind of haunted. Well, if you'd rather see Fatima... No, no, she can wait. And so, in 1915, multitudes finally saw and heard that marvelous new invention called the wireless. The demonstration booth at the Panama Pacific Exposition was conducted by Dr. Lee DeForest. And the programs he demonstrated to the crowd were transmitted by Charles Harold. So it was the two men, one to be known forever as the father of radio, and the other as the first broadcaster, worked together in giving the world its first major demonstration of radio entertainment. Yes, those who came to the Panama Pacific Exposition heard at last the music that had been brought to the air. And they heard voices in the air, too. This is the wireless telephone on the Garden City Bank building in San Jose, California. So through the years, this radio station has grown. Beginning with the world's first radio programs in 1909. Advancing with the world's first regular programming in 1912. Continuing to develop its programs and public service beyond the wildest dreams of its founder. Then, step by step, the radio industry progressed. August 20th, 1920. Station 8MK, Detroit, now WWJ, begins daily operation. 
November 2nd, 1920. KDKA Pittsburgh begins broadcasting regular schedule of programs with the Harding Cox election returns. July 2nd, 1921. First sports broadcast. The Dempsey Carpenter fight in Jersey City. September 7th, 1922. Station WEAF in New York broadcasts the first commercially sponsored program. 1923. President Harding speaks from St. Louis over a three-station network. 1924. The first broadcast of the national political conventions over nationwide networks. 1926. The national broadcasting company is organized. September 18th, 1927. The Columbia Broadcasting System on the air with 16 stations. 1928, Herbert Hoover officially notified of his nomination for presidency. His acceptance speech broadcast over a 107 station network from Palo Alto. 1931, first broadcast of a complete operatic performance from the Metropolitan in New York. March 12th, 1933, President Roosevelt broadcast the first of his fireside chats. December 7th, 1941, radio flashes the first news of the Jap sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. And in the war years that followed, Radio developed tremendous worldwide shortwave networks that enabled the people at home to follow the course of the war in a manner hitherto unknown. Today, November 10th, 1945, the world at peace. And radio, dedicated to the ideal of worldwide peace through closer cultural ties with all the peoples of the world. And so, as this week concludes the official observation of broadcasting's 25th anniversary, this radio station... A pioneer by more than a decade ahead of radio's official birth salutes all pioneer radio stations. Salutes with particular pride its founder, who is still living today. The first man to bring regular programs to radio, Charles D. Harold. We now present a message by Dr. Charles D. Harold, transcribed this afternoon at his home in the Piedmont Hills, returning his voice to the same station he founded so many years ago. I'm gratified and happy to speak to you on this occasion. Station KQW has gone far beyond my dreams. I am particularly proud that the dream we had for radio as an entertainment medium has materialized. Radio has indeed outgrown its infant clothes. I am happy to have been the first man to broadcast radio entertainment on a regular schedule. The story of KQW has been written and produced by Roy Grandy. The associate director was Don Victor. The cast included Dick Ellers, Herb Ellis, Dick Glyer, and Jack Webb. Sound effects by Don Creed. Engineering, Paul Smith. Your announcers have been Clarence Cassell and Ken Ackerman. <laughs> All material presented on this program is from carefully authenticated documents, interviews, and newspaper files. This, the story of KQW, is dedicated to Charles D. Harold, the man who developed the world's first radio station to present regular broadcasts, and saw it grow until today we are able to say, This is KQW San Jose, the Columbia station for San Francisco, Oakland, and the Bay Area.